Welcome to Cracking the Code, a blueprint to distorted thinking. Your presenter today is Scott Anderson with the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services. Providing support today is me, Derek Longmire, Executive Director at Problem Gambling Network of Ohio, as well as Mike Bazelli, Associate Director at Problem Gambling Network of Ohio. Just a little background about PG&O and who we are. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that's been in existence for about 10 years. And uh, we are the Ohio affiliate to the National Council on Problem Gambling. We are fortunate enough to be one of 35 affiliates throughout the nation. So we get to uh, network, learn, and uh, get better with all of our friends across the country. Uh, we provide support for those that are impacted by gambling through uh, awareness campaigns that we have um, going out in communities and throughout the state. Uh, through quality assurance calls that we provide to the Ohio Problem Gambling Helpline and through workforce development for our uh, professionals in uh, prevention, uh, those that are in treatment, and as well as those recovery advocates. Uh, we are a membership-based organization, which allows us to uh, make sure that we have strong advocacy and when uh, necessary, uh, lobbying in place to ensure that we are uh, providing support and the voice for those that will be impacted through gambling and gambling expansion. Uh, with that, we do take a, a neutral approach. So we are neither for or against gambling, but we do uh, view it as our responsibility to be the voice for those that are often voiceless, uh, particularly as we're looking at um, those interests throughout the state and throughout the nation in expanding uh, gaming and gambling. Uh, we do take that disease, uh, pers disease perspective and approach and ask that uh, we continue to work through communities to better understand what stigma looks like with uh, gambling in addition to substance use and mental health issues and know that we are not alone and that we've got uh, great partners throughout the nation that can kind of help carry us through. Uh, just some logistics for today. This session is being recorded and will be available on the PGNO YouTube channel within 48 hours. And you will also get a follow-up email with that link to that YouTube channel. We have applied for CEUs for the Ohio Chemical Dependency Professionals Board, as well as the Ohio Social Work Ma Marriage Family Therapist and somebody else board that I'm leaving out. Um, due to COVID, those uh, processing has been extremely delayed. Uh, we have just learned that we've got approval from one of the sessions um, that we had a month ago, and that came either yesterday or the day prior. So uh, as soon as we get those approvals, then we will send those certificates out to you, but know that there's a pretty substantial delay in processing those. Uh, with that, I'll turn things over to Scott to take us through uh, cracking the code. Scott, over to you. Thanks, Derek, and welcome, everybody. Um, appreciate everybody being on. I am uh, broadcasting live from an, uh, a plant wall in the Huntington Center in downtown Columbus, Ohio. It's um, it's a, it's really um, nice that we can all figure out ways to continue to provide service for one another and our and our constituents through all this. It's been quite quite a, a challenge for everybody I know, so I really much appreciate you being on for today. Um, this is a this is a reproduction kind of of a presentation that Mike Rosen from the the uh, Center for Addiction Treatment in Cincinnati and I did at the at the conference, the PGO conference here in in uh, in Ohio this year, and it's a it's a really interesting thing as you as you talk to gamblers. Um, one of the things that has to be addressed is is this cognitive distortion uh, and it can be daunting so we're, we're going to go through a couple of those things um uh there won't let me advance my screen and scott if you're not able, able to pull it up you should be able to either use the arrow button or the little powerpoint thing I, I, I'm doing both of those. So I'm trying to get out of it now and try to reset it, but it's not doing anything now. Okay, please stand by.
Now it worked when we first started, but it's not doing anything now and it won't let me back out of it either. Okay, Scott, I will take back control and then see if we can uh, get that to move forward. Scott, are you able to advance now? No, I'm not. It's not doing it. Oh, yeah, there it goes. Okay, well, it, so. it jumped the screen ahead, but then uh, that's actually a different presentation. Okay, so what is on the screen right now is from my computer? Yeah, that's, um, that's the can. original thing from Mike Rosen. If you want to advance it, we'll just go through that one. Yeah, that we can do. Um, one of the things that's um, it, that we want to talk about with gambling is as a as a pastime is there's a lot of patterns in our lives. We're we're inherently hardwired to look for these patterns. It helps us with survival. It helps us with uh, day to day activity. Uh, discussing we want to discuss some of the dangers of creating these for ourselves and then finding them in areas where that where we're making them up. We're literally not. Um, they're literally not there and we're going to try to make them up and a lot of our unconscious decisions influence gambling behavior so we want to understand how these cognitive distortions are experienced by problem gamblers and we're going to talk about some types of treatment basic interventions and things like that that we can do okay we can move on or i can can i do it from i can it the keyboard and mouse, so you should be able to then advance the slides from your end. It's not doing anything. Oh, there it goes. We're doing that. Okay, so um, a couple of things. Um, an epiphany is, and you've heard this term before, it's illuminating a realization. It's an essence of a meaning. It's suddenly revealed or made known. It's like, you know, waking up and, and finding, seeing, smelling the roses, right? And then apophenia is our tendency to perceive a connection or a meaningful pattern between unrelated or random things, either objects or ideas. And we'll talk about some examples of that and how that affects gamblers in, in just a second. And then there's the gambler's fallacy. And this is a, it's a mistaken belief that, that past random events are, are not independent at all, that they can influence future results. That, um, you know, the, the biggest example of this is that slot machines are due. That if if you know or a, or I won on this slot machine two weeks ago, so it must be lucky for me. So this this same machine is going to be lucky again. Um, it's it's a it's it's the way that our heads work normally or or regularly, but in gambling it can be very very hard to overcome when it's when it's not really true at all. Um, gambler's ruin is a it's a statistical concept, and you think about a gambler with a, a limited amount of money. In a fair game going up against a casino with billions of dollars just by odds alone over time the gambler will not come out ahead the, the the person with the more infinite wealth can play longer stay in the game longer and eventually one of you is going to go broke and it's the one with a, a limited number of resources and then there's the illusion of control and this is um, very very prominent in in problem gamblers and actually in, in a lot of us that we believe somehow that by something we do, we can control an outcome. Um, and it's, it's you know, we, we believe we have, we're luckier than other people. We have some sort of special skills. We've studied the game. We've watched other players. We have a lucky shirt. We have whatever, whatever the case may be that somehow we can control an outcome by, by some of the beliefs or that, or the, some of the rituals that we, uh, that we do in, in the game. Um, pattern recognition, it's universal, it's, it's something everyone does, it affects every single person in, in, some, in some way, there's no limit to it. It's, it's in humans, it's in animals, it's in inse insects, it's in viruses. Um, we follow patterns as part of our survival. 
Um, viruses follow a pattern. They follow, the, that's on the smallest molecular level, they follow a pattern. That's how they reproduce, that's how they spread, that's how they, they move about in society. And they're essential, um, right? Uh, patterns are, are essential. They help us to complete the daily tasks. Uh, think about how we get up in our ritual. We turn off our alarm clock, which foot do we put on the floor at the same time every morning? Um, how we go about our, what do we do first? What do we do second? What do we do next? Um, it's in what route do we take? Nobody ever started a path. Path is already there. We just follow the path. So they're, they're, they're things that are all around us all the time. They're very natural and normal. Um, but in gambling, they can take on a, a whole nother uh, level. So there's DNA. And it's, it's very pattern oriented. Every, every strand is, is laid out. There's a pattern. And that's all the way down to the DNA level. You have the universe. This is a picture taken from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, very, very much a pattern and a swirl. Um, they're, a, they're appealing to us when we see things like this in nature. They're very interesting to us. If that was just a random screen of stars, it wouldn't be interesting at all. But this, this, has, uh, this draws you in. It almost looks like it's pulling you in. Raindrops hitting water. You can look at those in the concentric rings going out. They're perfect circles as they move about. They're affected by the, the wind and the other raindrops. And if you watch long enough, you can determine, you know, directions and different things in, in patterns of, of that. It's a, and that's also soothing to us when things are in order. They make sense when this when this happens, that happens, and they make sense to us. Think about. If you've ever watched the ocean, as the waves come in, each one breaks nearly at the same place and they roll. Uh, even the sound is the same and it's soothing to, to watch, it's relaxing. So there's these things are all around us all the time. Uh, the rings of a tree, when you cut, when you cut a, um, a big tree down, you can see the rings in the tree. When we do landscaping, it's more appealing to us, right? When things are in order, when they're in rows, when they when they're laid out. So you know, rather than random trees, these are rows of trees, and they make sense to us. They draw us in. They make they make perfect sense. They're appealing to look at. Even random things like pebbles. When you look into pebbles, you can you determine why there's an order or why they're there. When they're just random rocks on a beach, but we can make them in our mind make sense in some way, but either by color or shape or design or location, we can make those more appealing to us. And we all love symmetry, right? We like balance. We like things to look like they're in order, so they're balanced. They, they they become appealing, pleasing to the eye. They make sense when they're when they're uh, when they're in symmetry. I mean, you know, the way we look at graphs or the way we look at information, it's more easily understood. It's more easily recognizable when it's when it's in order and it's it's logical to us in our mind. And think about sports, you know, they mow the baseball diamonds in patterns. They, uh, there's patterns on balls, sometimes for aerodynamics or for, for performance or for strength or durability, but there's patterns in, in things all around us and, and it makes sense. Uh, bridges, architecture, things are more appealing when they, when there's symmetry, when there's, when there's order. We feel safer when something looks like a, it's a structure that can, you know, hold up, a, hold up the car as we drive across the river. So there's a there's a lot of this stuff that that we have all around us all the time, that are, you know, both appealing, built for safety, built for structure, built for strength. But when we see something like that, we feel safer because it looks like it'll hold the train up, right? It 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 hangs. It hangs over the, the the river or over the canyon or whatever it is that you're crossing, and it makes sense that it that it looks structurally sound because it's in a pattern. It's not all, it's not randomly put together. And then there are things that are directional, right? Where do we throw the dart for the most points? Well, in, if you look at the pattern, it would be the bullseye. So sometimes they're directional. Sometimes they're they're necessary to understand rules or 
or how things work. Um, and then there's some things that are put together for. Oh, there it goes. Survival. Whoops, that one. Like uh, a spider's web, there's definitely a pattern there, but that's how the spider eats. Uh, that has to be put together in a certain way and over time for for the survival of the of the spider. And there it goes. Um, and then there's patterns in nature, in in leaves, in animals, and these sometimes these are used in mating rituals or to make them appealing to the other animals and their species. Um, <clears throat> leaf, leaves have ridges and patterns to collect water to, to, to direct rainwater or to direct sunlight. So those are great things. Um, fruit, right? Fruit looks better if, if, it's, if it's laid out orderly. So patterns can be a repeating design. It can be a natural or accidental sequence, but we will, we will find them. And they're relational, right? There's shapes, there's symbols, there's colors. There's all different ways patterns can can uh, present themselves, but they're in everything all around us all the time. And our brain is an organ of predictability, right? We like things. We don't like the unknown. We don't like change. We don't like unexpected. Um, we we like things to be predictable. We like to we like to know what we're getting into. And we recognize and we learn these patterns very quickly to assist in decision making. Kids cry brings their mom, right? It's it's a uh, uh, things are hot. We don't touch them anymore. We we learn, we learn, we learn, we learn. And there's neural networks are you know pretty sophisticated. Um, the neurons are the cells that that store and transmit information, uh, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, it's a system that works together they control our behavior they control what we do they control mood thought emotion are we hungry are we tired are we excited are we scared <clears throat> what is it that we're feeling and these these numbers are staggering there's like 86 billion of these neurons in us all the time and they're all connected to almost 10,000 more neurons and they process about 125 gigabytes of information a second um, it's amazing what you know your your some things are automatic your heart your breathing so forth you're cold you're hot uh, but all these things are going on all the time um, all around us and this is the the saying that that mike uses neurons that fire together and some of you probably thought wire together because it was taught to you at some point along the way in that clever little pattern sentence that rhymes so at some point that stuck and then when you saw it again you were able to to retrieve that information so sigmund freud was the guy that that kind of put this together he uh he thought about these theories some of which still are still used today and and he determined that some of these things are in our levels of consciousness either the the as we move forward here, the conscious mind, and that's the things we're presently aware of. I'm, uh, I'm looking out, the sun is shining, uh, it's kind of cold in this building, there aren't a lot of people around, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that are going on around me, I can hear the escalators behind me, so there's, there's things going on that I'm continuously aware of. Uh, my subconscious mind, not actively aware, but can easily become aware of, like, you know, there's something nagging at me, bothering me, I have a feeling, there's something in the background and then, oh yeah, that's what it is or that's where it is. <laughs> and then there's that a deeper uh, unconscious mind that, that's not actively aware and it's not active. So those are the things that Freud looked at and, and, and looked at with um, how decisions were made and, and different things. And this was a diagram that, that he put together. But if you look down in the unconscious level, the rational thought, Selfish needs, shame, immoral urges, violent motives, unacceptable things, fears, you know, that's pretty strong stuff to be going on underneath the surface of, of us all the time. Um, you know, and as we move up through the top of that, you know, you have the, the pre-conscious and conscious levels, but those unconscious levels are the things that can, that can really, really um, drive an awful lot of things in us if we're unaware of, of those things, and, and most of us are not. 
So uh, they said 95% of our decisions were made in that subconscious. That we're subconsciously making decisions before we're even consciously aware of it. So the uh, now back to bring that back into the casinos uh, and, the, and the gambling sites, if you look around in a casino, uh, if you've been in, how are they decorated? How are they laid out? Um, many of them have no windows. Many of them have no clocks or, or way to tell it uh, how much time has passed. Look at the, the carpeting in the play area versus the carpeting in the area where the food and dining is. Um, is it more exciting? Is it directional? Does the pattern in the carpet draw you in one direction or the other? How are the machines laid out? What's the uh, What's the signage look like? How are how are the um, how are the games advertised or marketed within the casino? What about the specials? What about the the you know 50 over 50 or the uh, free play or all those things that are if you've been in a in a casino or a racino, you're I am anyway. I'm I'm overwhelmed with the amount of sensory input. Uh, the sounds, the smells, the noises, the all of the things that go on. Uh, a couple of things, um, if you've been in a casino or racino, the, all of the machines, all of that din that you hear of the slot machines, it's all in the key of C. Every single machine is tuned to the key of C musically so that there's a harmony to it. It's not just a bunch of noise, it's all planful. So so it's not overwhelming to you when you're standing there and you're hearing all that noise. Um, the interruptions, of course, when the bells go off, if somebody if somebody hits a jackpot or, or a, some sort of win or, or accomplishment on one of the machines. But there's a, there's a very, very deliberate subconscious level of things going on in, in the gaming industry to, to draw us in and keep us in there. And they, they know this, um, and there's other things. Um, near misses are, are one of the things. Um, slot machine manufacturers are supposed to uh, limit the number of near misses on a slot machine. And this is where you get, you know, the bar, the bar, and then the bar is a half a spin up or down on the, on the last um, wheel as it goes around. Um, there's uh, free play is another one where they'll where if you sign up for something or you come on a certain day or a certain time, you get so many dollars in free play. Well, it, 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 it's free, obviously. You can use it and put it in the machine, but you can't cash it in for anything. You can't use it for anything. You put it in the machine, you get so many spins or so many credits. Um, but if you think about how people play, um, one of the one of the terms that that is always used is I'm playing with their money, so it, it's not as painful when you're losing money that you didn't come in with, but it kind of primes the pump for uh, folks to stay and play a little bit longer. Or when they lose, they don't think they lost as much because some of the money wasn't theirs anyway, um, and so forth. So there's there's definitely a, a marketing and a psychological um, end to that. Casinos will also, and this goes back to that gambler's fallacy or illusion of control, um, they'll put the, they do this in Baccarat too, which is a card game, but they will put the last several hands up or the last several numbers that the little marble landed on above the roulette wheel. So if you've watched roulette or, or you figure out how the game works, uh, a ball is put into a wheel that spins and the ball bounces around and it eventually lands in a number. Um, players are uh, can put their tokens on different numbers or different sets of numbers or rows or odds or evens or blacks or reds and things like that, and they can <clears throat> they can play. So the little marble doesn't have any memory of where it landed last or where it's going next. It's a marble. But when people see those numbers above the roulette wheel, some will walk through and they'll say, "Oh my goodness, look at that! All those numbers are almost all odd. Odd must be on a run." So I'm going to continue to play odd numbers because that's clearly how this is going. Or someone else would look at that and say, oh, look at that. All those numbers are almost all odd. That can't happen forever. I'm going to play even. And they play even. Both of them have the complete, completely convinced themselves that by looking at those numbers, they can determine an outcome of a game that's 
completely and totally based on chance and a ball bouncing around. Um, but both both what both would argue with you that they're right, that they're correct. Uh, some people will see uh, their birthdays or other important dates in their lives in the pattern and start playing dates that mean something to them, and they believe that that's that's going to change something. Um, the, the casinos, um, you know, we have uh, we have a list of people that, uh, or a list of not people, but a list of groups of people that that are at higher risk. Um, we we look at older adults, for instance. Um, older adults are at risk for a number of reasons. Um, one being that they have limited, usually limited resources or limited um, access to income. Some get monthly checks, some get pensions and things like that, but that's a, that's, that's a finite group of, of dollars. And if they do get in trouble, they, they don't have the ability to go back to work and make that back. So uh, there's also in older adults, there's the beginnings of some some cognitive impairments, um, early onset of dementia, or or something like that, or their medications, where you know they they have you know the ability to get in trouble faster with um, with some of this stuff. So the casinos, on the other hand, uh, send a bus out to the assisted living places, organize trips, um, give them some free play, maybe a five dollar coupon for lunch. And bring them into the casino. Uh, so we know that they're at risk, and the casinos know that too. So I'm not saying that they're doing that on purpose to bankrupt all the old people. I'm just saying that they know that that's a vulnerable group of people. And for some of those people, it's a great day out. They wouldn't get out otherwise. They're, they can be out and they can be social and they can play $20 and they can go home or back wherever they, they live and they're fine. But if they have any of those aforementioned risk factors and um, they may have a history of substance use or other problems in their life, um, that becomes a real, real attractive escape. Um, so you have to watch the marketing. Uh, you know, they have ladies night. They have veterans days or patriot days. Um, veterans are another group that we that we that we uh, look at um, as another risk factor. A lot of uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. Some have traumatic brain injury. Um, some get separated from the service on disability and they get large checks. Uh, so they, they may get a, a big check for, for back, um, back pay or back benefits. Um, and <clears throat> it's very easy to say, well, I could take half of this down at the casino and, and you know play poker. I'm really good at that or blackjack or put it in a slot machine and try to double my money. So. Uh, those things, those targeted marketing things. If if you have a, a, a gaming site in your in your area or near where you are, look at who they market to because that's who you need to market to too with your prevention and education efforts uh, to make sure that you're answering that that call as well. And then there's the the all superstitions. Um, these these take place sometimes. Uh, they're stronger in different uh, different groups of people, but Superstitions are really, really amazing. The um, the, uh, the the Asian population, for instance, uh, they they're very, very um, number oriented, right? You have you have they they won't um, the number four in the Asian culture written looks very similar to the symbol for death. So they won't sit in the fourth chair, they won't stay on the fourth floor, they won't go to the fourth table or the fourth slot machine. There's there's a very, very big significance to the number of four in that in that population. Um, if you've ever seen um, older adults play bingo or if you've ever played bingo yourself, they have their seat right at their table. They bring in photos of their relatives, they bring in for some reason, a troll with purple hair is very, very popular. Uh, they they have um, little talisman or the different tchotchkes they put around on the table in front of them. They have their own way of setting out their cards, their own uh, their own ritual of how they sit and different things. Um, we you know we've heard stories. Um, Bruce Jones, who is a clinician at Mary Haven here had a, a, a client that took Clorox wipes to the casino, which would probably be a good idea these days, but 
she would take and she would clean the whole machine because she thought if she was nice to the machine and took care of the machine that the machine would take care of her so she would go in with her wipes and she would she would like be tender and loving to the slot machine before she began playing she thought that that was going to help her in some way so some of these are very very deep seated and and they're um very hard to get by when you're when you're working with um with gamblers because back to that uh, you know those original terms and things we talked about originally people really really believe that these things are helping them and they're they're judging the outcome or they're believing they can affect the outcome by some of the things that they do so it, it, you, you, when you deal with a gambler when you're talking to a gambler it's good to ask them you know some of these things um we were in uh, west virginia not too long ago with the with the great West Virginia has a great program, really, really great people. Uh, we were invited to come down there for one of the retreats that they do. And I, uh, and I began uh, with a story. And uh, I work in the Rhodes Tower down here, which I can actually see from where I'm sitting, but I'm not allowed in there right now. Um, but the there's a woman, there's two uh, snack bar areas or convenience store areas inside that building where we can buy uh sandwiches and soda and popcorn and so and so forth they also sell lottery tickets in there and there's a woman that works for the department of taxation uh she comes in she's in every day and i'd, I'd seen her do this a number of times but she will has a list of numbers and she looks at her at her phone for the clock and looks and looks and looks and then at the last second she'll cut in line if there's people in front of her she apologizes to them and lets them know, and most of the people that work in the building know that she does this. Nobody gets too upset. And she plays her numbers right at a specific time every day. And I saw her do this a number of times, and I stopped her one day, and I said, hey, it looks like you have a system for the lottery. I've never been very lucky in that, and would you mind sharing with me? And she said, oh, and she got very, very excited and very animated. She took me to a table and opened up a notebook where she had an Excel spreadsheet with every three digit number that has come out in the lottery since like, you know, 1997. Um, she had a number of them circled. She pointed it out to me and she said, now look at this. Do you see the pattern? And I said, no, no, I'm afraid I don't. And she took a, a tic-tac-toe grid and she wrote the evening number from the, the day before in the middle three boxes and then in the top in the other boxes she wrote one two three four five six and then she circled the with the numbers in her excel excel spreadsheet to show me that they were due to come out and i said oh my goodness does this work and she said well sometimes and then she i said well you could play these any time of the day you don't have to wait until that last second she said oh no 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 the, i think the lottery figured out that i know this and if i don't play at the last minute they have time to change the number they can actually change the number on me so i don't win so you know this is a this is a <laughs> this is somebody that works in the in the department of taxation which which is kind of um Kind of frightening <laughs> actually if you think about it. put together other than this little little glitch in her giddy up but very very hard to convince her that she's not in a training somewhere and uh the, i went for ice and uh, grabbed this ticket and scratched it off when I got back. And this is an example of those near misses. So consider you were you were scratching this dollar ticket off, and you started at the you know the upper left, and you went down. Well, there's two 1800s, and oh my goodness! And then you got the nine. Wow, that's half of 18. And then you started on the other row, 200. Oh my God, two times nine is 18. Or you started at the bottom corner and you went on your way up and. You got 100 and then 100 and then, oh my God, 100 plus 100 is 200. So there's like all these patterns and things like this ingrained in this ticket where someone would say, no, you didn't, you lost. Uh, there's no there's no second place in, in scratch offs. You win or you lose, but 
that ticket is certainly laid out to make it look like you could have almost won. And I think I've got a bit of a lag here. Nope, there it goes. So, so when we're looking at these patterns, we're, we're primed for this. We're looking for these things. These things are all around us. And we're always trying to predict the next thing, right? We're going to, based on, based on all this information, we're going to try to predict the next outcome. So these things lead to our false patterns or seeing things that aren't real or aren't really there. And then we have that apophenia, which is the tendency to perceive a connection or meaningful pattern between totally unrelated things or random things. And that's, you know, back to my friend at, at, the, at the office. She has figured out somehow by writing down all these lottery numbers over, over the course of several years that she can find some sort of pattern in that and she can figure out what's going to happen next based on those numbers. Um, you know, truth be told, there is not a pattern. Um, it's a random number generator. And it, and not, well, about a month ago, um, I was doing another. And the evening three-digit number were the same. The two numbers uh, for the midday and the evening were the same. And I thought, oh, my goodness, somebody saw that and they're absolutely convinced they, they had some special power on that one, I'm sure. Um, but look, remember, uh, if you remember, not too long ago, they had uh, pictures of one of the uh, spacecraft that was circling Mars, and there was this rock pattern, and everybody thought it was a human face. And it does look like a human face, but it's actually just shadows and rocks, And but we made it into something that that was more appealing or more interesting or more science fiction-y than that. Uh, the World Trade Center, when the smoke was billowing out, uh, someone found this picture of the face of the devil in the World Trade Center. I actually remember when that was printed. And this happens quite often. Uh, we find the, the Virgin Mary, uh, generally find, find her in uh, potato chips or uh, grilled cheese sandwiches, but people will, will find these. And the problem... That pattern is the fact that they can sell these slices of pizza on eBay um, after this, and people these uh, these oddities in food food art. Here's a there's a Jesus Cheeto. Uh, clearly, I mean, um, and if you if you remember the movie um, A Beautiful Mind. This guy uh, was based on a, on a true person, but uh, they had a really good depiction of him looking at numbers, and, and this was in one of his uh, his schizophrenia moments, but he was determining patterns of numbers and groups of numbers, uh, and that was how his, his um, illness manifested, but um, it's a real good depiction of that in, in, a, in a grand scale in that, in that movie. So more, more of these uh, examples, and we talked about um, the numbers from evening to noon. Uh, there's no correlation in any of those things, but people will perceive, you know, they were all odd, they were all even, they were, you know, they represented my, my weight, my birthday, my, you know, my address, um, any number of things that, you know, that I think correlate to the patterns and things that are moving um, uh, the trolls, good luck charms, people will uh, wear lucky shirts or lucky socks or not wear socks or any number of things uh, because they think they can affect outcome. Uh, when we were in West Virginia, I put these things out to the group and I asked, um, what are some of the ones that, that you've heard? Um, some of them were very, very interesting that you play for a set number of, of minutes um, when you reach in whatever the number of minutes is, you cash out and then you put a $20 bill in the machine because that tricks the machine into thinking that you're a new player or a new person. Um, one of the folks down there takes his cell phone 
uh, sets his cell phone next to the slot machine or turns his cell phone on in his pocket so that he can uh, uh, somehow affect the machine through Bluetooth. Um, and I asked him, I said, oh, are the, are the slot machines hooked up to the internet? And he said, no, 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 nothing's hooked up. So he, you can, he can say that, that they're not hooked up to the internet, but he can also say with certainty that the Bluetooth um, has something, something to do with it. Um, and, and it's just, it's just simply not the case. Um, we all have lucky numbers, right? I mentioned those, our address, our, our whatever, our birthday, anniversary days, um, sobriety days, whatever they may be. We have these lucky numbers that we think are, are somehow influencing um, outcomes. And, and the, the, the lottery is chosen with random number generators. Slot machines are set up with random number generators. Uh, there is no greater likelihood that you'll um, win on a machine and this is this we should we had a, a film of this actually that we that we do in some of our trainings that some of you may have seen but there's a random number generator in a slot machine that is continuously working right now even though the casinos have been closed as long as they're plugged in they are working they're scrolling through hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of number combinations and pattern combinations and they're doing it all the time. They're running and 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 then you push the button and they stop. And whatever that combination is at that specific moment is the combination of, of symbols that comes up on the screen. It doesn't have anything to do with how many times you play, how long you play, how many times you push the button, how many times the person before you pushed the button, how long the machine has been there, and nothing to do with anything. It's a random number generator and every single person that pr presses a button, it's a, it's a totally unique event from any other event that has occurred in the history of that machine. Um, you'll have people swear by, by things about, you know, like the woman that wipes the machine down with Clorox wipes, or you, they think that the machines closest to the door uh, pay off better because they're closer to, the, to where people see them or the machines in the back play off better because not as many people play, or the third machine from the left on a day that it's raining. I mean, people will come up with any number of things. And it's based on, you know, last time I was here, I put a dollar in that machine and I won. So clearly, clearly that machine is lucky for me. Um, it, it really doesn't have any basis. In fact, uh, the machines are gonna play the, the way they play, whether somebody's standing there playing them or not but we will convince ourselves that there's something to that and that'll guide our, our decision making in, in the casino. Uh, and I, you know, I mentioned that with other games, the randomness of the, the roulette wheel. Uh, there, there are exceptions to some of these things. Um, you could actually be really good at playing poker. You could learn to play poker. <coughs> Excuse me, there are some skills involved. There is some strategy involved in poker. So someone who, who was good at that and played poker a lot would probably do very well against someone like me that doesn't play poker. So you can have an edge or, or a, a slight advantage in games like that or blackjack or baccarat that are card games or card oriented. But even then, the casinos in Ohio play with six decks. So um, even if you were exceptional at counting cards, six decks is an awful lot of numbers to keep track of over time. Um, then they put a stop in if you've played where it, when, it, when the uh, card shuffler reaches a certain point, they stop, they redeck, and they go back into the beginning again. So even if you were uh, really good at that, like uh, Ben Affleck, uh, who's been apparently thrown out of a couple of places, um, you, you still don't have an advantage because there's still chance, right? The next card is still chance, no matter what what, what you think. Uh, this is a cartoon about gambler's fallacy. Um, you can you can look at that um, on your own, but there's there's so much of this. There are so many things um, in that gambler's fallacy where we really really believe that we can somehow correlate events uh, that have no combination to each other, no no relation to each other, 
and that it can drive uh, decisions as, as we move forward. Uh, Derek, I think you had a couple polls. Maybe this would be a good time to throw one of those up. Is that going to work? Yep, there the poll question is coming to your screen right now, so you can just take a few minutes to complete that. And the poll question number one is, you can improve your chances of winning by having a system. You can select true or false. Give you five more seconds to let your voice be heard, and then we will close out that poll. That looks like two percent or six percent said true, and ninety-four percent said false. And and. Um... The only system that can help you win is setting limits. <laughs> um, um, there, there really isn't a, there, I mean, there really isn't a way that you can improve your chances. It's, um, it's really based. It's, 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 it's largely random, largely chance, and even the games that have a, a skill element, like we just discussed, those games still are largely based in chance. There's still a chance element. And Scott, do you want me to launch that second poll? Yeah, you can do that while we're... That's coming up to your screen shortly. The more you play a slot machine, the more likely you are to win because the machine is due. And respondents said, 100% said that is not accurate. <laughs> good. Now that's good. It's, um, it's a really um, strongly held belief, though, that you know, people think they can, they can outsmart, outsmart the casino. And generally speaking, they didn't build those big, beautiful women buildings and give away all those crab legs on money that they gave out. And here's our final poll question. Setting limits on time and money greatly improve your chances to leave a winner. I gave that one away. We'll see who's paying attention. <laughs> And this is a little bit more evenly split than the others. The 73% said true and 27% said false. So we recommend, um, it, you know, and we have the Be the 95 uh, campaign and the Get Set Before You Bet um, is, the, is the latest version of that. Uh, and it, if you work with um, if you work with a gambler, um, we and these are these are kind of uh, dirty words in in our substance use field, but we don't recommend um, abstinence right off the bat unless the person is involved in an illegal gambling of some kind, or they're underage, or you know there's a, there's another reason they're playing in a, in an illegal uh, fashion. You know you don't want to that's necessarily recommend abstinence because most gamblers still have all of these deep-seated beliefs and these cognitive distortions. Um, we've had people appear for treatment. They're in trouble with their wife. They're in trouble with their job. They're in trouble with, um, you know, society in general. They owe a bunch of money. They're in trouble with the bank. Um, you begin to treat them. And what is the one way they could get out of all that trouble? They could just hit a jackpot and they would be fine, right? 
So it's hard to convince them that they're digging the hole deeper um, when the one way they can get out of all that trouble is the actual cause of the trouble in the first place. Um, we've, we've had people present for treatment that, um, that, well, I can't quit now. I have almost $600 on my player club card in free food vouchers. I've got sandwiches coming. I've got, I've got three buffets and two shows and free parking for a month. I, I can't quit now. I, I would waste all this. I would, I would, I would be giving up all these these free things and these things that I've earned, you know, over the years in my in my play. So it's it's hard to overcome some of these beliefs when you're dealing with somebody that you know they're they're deep seated. They're they actually are very hard to change. Um, and, we, and we talked about that time and money. It's if you can take whatever your dollar amount is when you're working with a gambler, well, what is the amount that you think that you can stick to? Is it an hour <coughs> or is it a hundred dollars or whatever the case is? And can you do that? And then the next appointment, how did it go? Well, I didn't stick to it. Well, what happened? And you can begin to look at the causes of why someone wasn't able to maintain uh, those, those, uh, those limits e either in time or money. Now, Time is an interesting one because I'm on the slot machine and I'm winning. So why would I stop? Why would I quit now, even though my deal was an hour or two hours or five hours, whatever it was? Why would I stop when I was ahead? So you'll you'll have people that will argue that time is is not going to work, or uh, I know my hour is up, but I'm still down twenty dollars. I have to stay and play until I'm even. So you'll get a lot of pushback on on setting those limits in time. And this is especially true with kids in gaming. If you tell your, your kid or whoever it is that they can only play the game for two hours, at the end of two hours, they're the one of the last three people left uh, on, on, uh, on the island and they have to stay in the game or they if they get up and walk away at two hours, they're going to lose for sure. Well, heck, heck no, I'm not quitting at two hours. I'm going to stick this game out. So sometimes setting limits on kids with gaming is very difficult, too, because they're not going to stop in the middle or at the end or near the end when they, when they, when they uh, have made commitments to other people, especially when they're playing in a multi, multiplayer game systems and stuff like that. They're not going to stop at an hour or two hours, whatever the limit is. They're going to continue playing until that game is over. So Sometimes you have to be a little creative in, in uh, how you set those limits with, with uh, the, the gaming, especially. So, uh, Derek, I can't advance again. I think you still have control. You should be able to, but let me just bring it back over here and see. Okay, try it now. coming up ah, there you go there it goes um this is a another um example of the of the fallacy um we do this in our training with a coin flip so you know on, on the left hand side you have the guy that wins so he's on a streak so he's going to keep going and on the other side you got somebody that loses so they're going to stay in the game because they're due and we've done this, and you can do this um, in, in groups or with your folks too, but with a coin, every single time you flip a coin, it's 50-50 odds of it being heads or tails. Uh, it's, it's just not going to go any other way. And we've done these things in our groups where we'll flip the coin five times, and we have the group predict what the next five are going to be, and then we flip again. Um, or, um, you know, and we'll, we'll ask, you know, what's the next going to be and we'll get you know well it's got to be heads because tails just came out twice in a row so it has to be heads or it's going to be tails because tails just came out twice in a row and it's obviously just going to keep being tails um, you'll have both arguments in the same in the same group and it's always really interesting to to hear the folks uh, argue why they think they're right the, the, the right answer is it's 50 50 it could be heads or it could be tails and the odds of it doing that are even every single time um, oddly enough we've had at least two different groups we've done that with where we had heads come out five times in a row in the first in the first group of that which is that's a, a wonderful conversation starter when you know everybody accuses us of having uh, fixed coins and and all kinds of things it's actually quite humorous 
So how, how do these things go together in, in our head? Um, filtering is the way that, you know, we only remember those wins. We don't remember, um, you know, the losses as well as we remember, oh my goodness, you know, you might have played 300 times, but you win 50 bucks on one or 100 bucks on one, and that's what you remember. You don't remember pushing that button and watching the wheel go around all those other times. You just remember, oh my God, I just hit 100 bucks. So um, it's that's that's one way that this manifests. The other one is, is is the black and white thinking. It's incredibly difficult to to stick to limits when you're in this deep because you want to get your money back, right? That's how in the in the diagnostic criteria. This is called chasing. Um, we will will play riskier or we'll play um, bigger bets or we'll try to get our money back because we can't go out of here without all that money, right? I my wife gave me a hundred dollars to go to the grocery store. I pulled in here for a few minutes. Now it's four hours later and we still need things that I'm supposed to get at the grocery store. I can't go home without money. So um, th there's a, a real, real problem with sticking to limits when you think that the casino owes you your money back or you you know, you need to stay until you're even or you're ahead and you don't want to stop, whatever it is. Um, and then the overgeneralization is, is have, you know, lucky machines or I always win on Wednesday or, or, Every every time I eat a, a club sandwich before I I gamble, I the first you know jackpot is you know is on the way, uh, whatever it is that you you come up with, um, it, it, it's very very dangerous thinking to to um, think that there's some really uh, accurate way to depict how you're going to win or or lose. It's just not there. Um, and then what if this next spin hits the jackpot? And that's what, you know, you'll talk to a lot of gamblers that think they're just one more away. They're one play away. If I stop now, what if that next one was it? What if that next spin of the wheel or the next spin of the roulette wheel or the next card at the blackjack table or the next lottery ticket I bought? What if that was it? What if I stopped too soon? Um, you know, what is what is that? And then the casinos are really good. Well, all of the, the venues are really good at separating you from actual dollars. And by that, I mean you get tokens or you get credits or you get chips or you get something that determines, um, you know, how you continue to play. Uh, this, even the, the uh, lottery vending machines now have a uh, cashless system so you can play with your credit card or your debit card and buy lottery tickets. So that's painless, right? You just swipe your card and walk off with your with your tickets. Um, so there, there, there's not a, it doesn't look like you're putting 50 bucks in, it looks like you swiped your card. So there's a, there's definitely a separation of, of the amount there real quick. And then uh, Mike uh, Rosen does a really good job of explaining this, the fallacies versus the fairness. Uh, we, right, the rules should be fair, right? The rules should be fair. I should be able to go in a casino, it should be me against them and they should be fair. And that's just not the case. Uh, the the gambler's ruin is the statistical concept that if a gambler with, uh, you know, I have $100 I'm going to play with. I walk into the casino. The casino has a lot more than $100. And if I stay, anybody ever play the card game War when you were a kid? You each had a deck of cards, and eventually one person ended up with all the cards. It's just the way the way life works. And in, in going up against a casino with billions and billions of dollars and whatever you're walked in with, they have the time to take it all. And these are these are some of the things uh, we talked about a lot of this stuff already, but um, people will walk in and they'll believe in some form or, or uh, thing that they can influence the outcome. And, and they'll tell you these things. And it's good to ask these things. If you're dealing with a problem gambler, it's good to ask these questions. Tell me about what some of the things you do. What are some of the rituals? Um, you've seen people blow on dice. Um, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll play a slot machine for a certain number of minutes or a certain number of spins, and then they'll move to another machine. Um, they'll watch somebody playing a machine and get up and leave and they'll rush over and, and start playing the machine because they think the machine is due or that they can somehow uh, gain an, uh, an advantage by that. Um, if you look at uh, the machines, if you've been in any of the racinos or any of the, uh, the casinos here or anywhere, if you look, you know, they have Dukes of Hazard, Sex in the City, 
uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, The Wizard of Oz, uh, Wheel of Fortune is a real big one now. Um, I mean, they go on and on and on and on and on. Um, they had uh, Smokey and the Bandit the last time I was in there. They have Pharaoh's Gold. They have the Egyptian theme. They have uh, they have animal ones. They have ones with cats and ones with dogs. And there's one with fish. Um, but if you look at the machines, they 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 are the it's just the face of the machine that looks like that. The inside of that machine is identical right down the row. There is nothing different inside that machine all the way down the row. So uh, they, they're designed to appeal um, back to that, you know, uh, I like dogs, so I'm going to play this machine with the dogs on it. Or I, you know, I like uh, whatever the movie was or whatever the TV show was, and, and, I, and I, I'm drawn to that game either by demographic or by my age or by my you know whatever there's there's something appealing about a specific game to me uh truth be told the inside of that machine and the inside of the next machine and the inside of the machine after that are identical they all look and act the same way and they all work the same way um there if when the and derek is real good about um getting us into the casinos for tours uh, sometimes, and, and you can contact uh, Derek and PGO you know, if you if you'd like to do that. Sometime we can take you with us into one of the into one of the venues. But um, we we try not to go in uh, like a group of ten of us and stand behind somebody at a slot machine or at a poker table and try to watch them play. We try to divide ourselves up a little bit so it doesn't look like we're all a bunch of social workers trying to figure a guy out, right? So, um, but in, in, you know, there are some that are on a streak that want, hey, watch this, watch this, watch this, but that's not the, the general case. Um, and skill versus luck. We talked about that um, at random games, there's randomness. At chance games, there's chance. There is a, a small amount of skill that is available to you in the game like poker or a game like blackjack, but in the other games, there is absolutely no no benefit um, and there's so many myths uh, uh, one of them that is very very popular is that they pump oxygen into the building to keep people awake longer um, this has been around a really long time if you really think about that concept uh, the, the the buildings are enormous if they were pumping oxygen in uh, it would be extremely expensive um, they would also be oxygenating a big building full of people, and if a fire ever broke out, or and you have all those electronics, and in most states you have people smoking. Um, so if a fire ever broke out in an oxygenated environment like that, it would be a, a it would be a very very bad thing. Um, it is true that some of the the uh, casino companies use um, vanilla or cinnamon or floral scents. To, some of that's to mask the smells that you know occur in there uh, through uh, smoking or 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 whatnot, or, or make it more appealing. So there is some aromatherapy sometimes that 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 is evident, but there's there's no oxygen being pumped in. Um, and then there's a lot of myth that machines pay out differently. Um, I had somebody when I was just now here talking about this, uh, looking for a plug to plug into, um, say that uh, that. The, it's Wednesday and the machines at one of the racetracks pay off better on Wednesdays. Um, it, it's not it's not by time or day of week or anything. They're not due. They don't change. Um, every slot machine in Ohio has to pay out at 85% over the statistical life or theoretical life of the machine. So that means that if you take a slot machine and you say that the theoretical life of this machine is a million pulls or whatever it is, that 85% of the of the money that the machine takes in is going to be returned. Um, however, if I mean that sounds good, but if you think about if I uh, told you that your 401k or your retirement at work or your uh, your Roth Roth IRA account was going to lose 15% uh, over time, that would not sound like a good deal to you at all. So 85% on, you know, it, it, yeah, that's better than nothing. But uh, if you think about how people play, um, we talked about this a little bit. I put 20 bucks in and then um, I win a little, I lose a little, I win a little, I lose a little. And I'm there for 45 minutes and I exhaust the credits from the machine. 
I won 85% of the time and I walked away with nothing. So think about it in, in all real terms, um, even though that sounds good, um, there is a slot tournament setting that the machines can be put on. Um, these are promotions that the casinos do. I know the casino in Cincinnati did this where they'll take a set number of machines and the, there's a set number of uh, odds and, and people play, you know, in groups of 20, you pay to play and you, and you, and you have a tournament on slot machines. Um, but that, but that's a, a, a unique circumstance in a controlled setting in a limited time. It's not, it's not over a long time. Um, we've had a, this, this I've seen. I saw it this morning actually, um, where someone will ask what the number is at the bottom of the scratch-off ticket, um, and they think, oh, whoa, that's a good number. Let me buy five of those from that roll. Uh, the numbers on the machines are, are on the lottery tickets are obviously to keep track of the lottery tickets. Uh, they're they're inventoried. Uh, you know, they're main, there's some controls maintained on those lottery tickets, but it doesn't have anything to do with what, if it's going to win or not. And you'll have people say, oh, yeah, yeah, the low numbers are better than the high numbers or the middle numbers are better than the first and the last numbers or the odd numbers are better than the even numbers or the oh, no, no, the last 10 tickets in the roll are always the ones that win. Um, if that was true, the lottery would change it. I mean, really, think about it. If, if there was a way that someone could figure out how to only buy winning tickets and somebody figured it out, then the lottery would change it. They wouldn't let it continue. So there's really no truth to that. Um, uh, the lottery is, is, you know, monitored by the auditor of state. They have random number generators. There's, there's really not um, the, the, the one thing that the lottery sort of can control is if they print, uh, you know, a, a, a thousand tickets, they know how many dollars of winners are in that in that block or in that uh, run. So they, they do know that as a, as a general, uh, the lottery uh, scratch offs, I think, pay out at about 60 percent. Uh, so they know that, but they don't know which tickets are and there's no way to determine that. And, and think about some of the ones you've heard. Um, um, I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm, I listen and I'm a little bit more in tune, but um, uh, there, there's an awful lot of, of, of things that people believe or, or, or think about uh, how, how these things get started and how they, how they per persist. And it's important to talk if you have a client, ask them about these things because you're going to have to argue um, at some point against all this, all this amazing logic. Uh, there it goes. And these these are the odds, the house edge. Um, um, back or at, the odds can change by the number of decks used or the uh, number of people at the table, uh, but the house always has an advantage. Um, blackjack actually has the best odds for you as a player um, going up against. And again, that, that 0.5 up to 4% depends on how many decks are are used. Um, craps, the odds for the house depend on the... the uh, Number of people at the table, the number of um, the people that that bet. There's 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 hundreds of different ways to bet at at, at craps. If you've ever played, it's a it's a pretty complicated game. Um, and Kino um, is available here in Ohio. It's usually at most of the casinos. Um, roulette. You would think there's 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 red and black, and there's a set number of numbers. Um, but on American uh, roulette wheels, there's a zero and a double zero. So it's not all red and black. There's a slight, um, a slight variance in the 50-50. Uh, here's a little trivia fact for all of you guys. Uh, you might be on uh, Jeopardy one day or something. If you add up all the numbers on a roulette wheel, you just add them all up, it comes out to 666. Now, there's, a, there's a little trivia for you. Uh, slot machines, again, you know, it depends on the, on the state and what their, um, ours are 85% uh, theoretical. And then uh, video poker can <clears throat> can vary, but every one of them is not in your favor. It's it's absolutely not in your favor. And it's also we should point this out too when you're treating a gambler is to find out what game they 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 like. What is it that they do? Uh, slot machines are very immediate, right? You can play <clears throat> every every so many seconds. You could play you could probably play 30 or or so spins in a minute. 
So that's that's a very, very quick moving, immediate return, boom, 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 boom constant, constant, constant distraction. Um, roulette takes a little longer. Everybody has to place their bet. Everybody has to be quiet. Everybody has to move their hands from the table. The ball spins. We have to wait for the ball to land. The, the person running the table then tells you how it went. Um, Keno in Ohio is played every four minutes, right? That's a lot different lottery game than the lotto or the Powerball or the Mega Millions um, or, or one of those. Mega Millions is drawn twice a week. So if I'm if I'm going to play the Mega Millions, it, chances are I'm not going to have a problem with lottery play because I can only play twice a week. I have to wait until the end of the week or the you know the middle of the week to, to see what number came out. But the pick three is twice a day. The pick four is twice a day. Keno is every four minutes. That's a different game. Scratch offs again. That's immediate. That's right now. So um, it's important to know um, craps is a is an extremely social game. You have somebody rolling dice and you have people betting for or against how they're going to do. Uh, they're all around a table. There's camaraderie. There's cheering on the guy that has the dice that's rolling. Uh, the guy rolling is the center of attention. Um, that's a totally different game than poker. I don't want people talking to me playing poker. I'm sitting by myself, I'm strategizing, I'm, I'm imagining what other people have, I'm looking for tells, I'm, I, I'm intellectualizing the, the, the way the game is going, the cards and things like that. That's a totally different gambler than somebody playing a slot machine. So it's very important to know what type of gambling that person is, is engaged in that you're treating because that's going to determine um, you know, a lot about how you're going to treat them. Is it immediate? Is it delayed? Is it is it strategy? Is it escape? Is it what is it? What is it that they find appealing about um, the game that they play? Um, this is a kind of a cool thing. Uh, Mike had this um, uh, in a video. You can look this up on YouTube. But if you shuffle a deck of cards, um, the the chances of you shuffling a deck of cards and having it come out identical two times in a row is that number right there it's at 8.065 8 times 10 to the 67th it's it's absolutely astronomical um the, the way it's explained is that you know if, if i if i take a card out of the deck and turn it over it's the queen of hearts the the i had there's there's 51 chances um you know of, of what the next card would be to to, to turn over and then there's 50, and then there's 49. So it's it's really exponentially difficult to um, to predict even in a, in a simple one deck of cards what what the outcome is going to be. Um, we talked about this a little bit. Um, mindfulness is is a great way to um, to reach some of these people because we have um, overwhelming cravings, overwhelming desire, overwhelming um, thoughts. Um, so mindfulness is a good way to try to slow somebody down. This is really good for uh, relapse prevention and things like that. Acceptance and commitment therapy is there as well. Um, very good way to uh, slow somebody down. Um, initially, motivational interviewing, MI, uh, has proven to be very effective with this group. Um, we have to meet them where they're at. Um, I often said, you know, my background is 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 clinical. I worked in the prison system as a clinician for for a long time, and in private um, private agencies, um, it doesn't take any clinical skill whatsoever to point out negative behavior in our clients. <clears throat> That's why they're there, right? Um, so you, but and I, there wasn't anybody that walked in that I couldn't tell them what things they needed to do to get better. Right, because we're all smart, we're all educated. Some of us have been there, but you can't do that, um, especially with a gambler, uh, especially with all these cognitive and, and other things that they're coming through the door with. So um, motivational interviewing, meet, meeting them where they are, <clears throat> and of course, all the things we've been talking about today. Cognitive behavioral therapy (CBT) is huge. You have to work with them to convince them that. You know that that some of those thoughts and some of those distortions just based they're just not based on the fact that that they have to get past some of those things. So mindfulness, MI, and CBT um, are huge, huge, huge um, things that we need to do. Uh, and we're at the end of the, the these slides, but I wanted to take a minute and talk to you guys um, before we open it up for other questions. 
Um, I, I was on the National Council for Problem Gambling webinar yesterday about the casinos reopening. Um, <clears throat> casinos reopened in Las Vegas last week. Um, if you saw any of the of the uh, news footage of that, there was zero social distancing. There was there was um, very very little control inside the casinos. Hopefully, uh, um, Ohio's casinos and racinos are going to open on the 19th of this month, and we're going to see how that goes. Um, some of the some of the questions that National Council asked and, and asked of all of us was. One, you know, there is still a huge threat of the, of the COVID transmission out there. Uh, what precautions are the casinos taking and racino taking, gaming venues taking uh, to keep people separated? Um, I know they were going to do every fourth slot machine and only three people at a table and things like that. But if someone is willing to go into a casino and all these other risks out there, how badly do they really want to gamble? Um, the other uh, problem that we may run into is, is obviously transmission of the virus and things like that. But an awful lot of us had a change in our financial situation. Uh, there's been layoffs, there's been um, restructuring of companies, restructuring of positions. Uh, people have lost jobs permanently. So uh, when somebody is running into the casino in that frame, um, are they trying desperately to win money to survive? Are they, is this going to be their escape or their solution to their current financial situation? Uh, we've also seen a spike in problems with the stimulus checks that went out at the beginning of this. So someone, you know, uh, all of a sudden had a check, you know, for 1200 or 2400 or whatever their, their family um, allowed. But all of a sudden, they have they have cash, uh, and we know that from the substance use world, that's a relapse tri trigger, right? Uh, all of a sudden, having a a, a bunch of money um, in in uh, in your hands that you didn't expect or didn't have before. So, so keep all those things in mind as as some of your um, clients who may not have been able to gamble throughout this period of time or suddenly find themselves um, with, uh, with urges to get back in there uh, because they've been out for so long. Um, but you know, the, all those things are present. So please keep those things in mind um, as you're dealing with, uh, dealing with your folks going forward. So um, we have about 10 minutes left. I, I don't see any other questions in the, uh, in the box right now, but if anyone has any other questions, you can type them in now. Um, it's been a, it's been great talking with you guys. I've had a number of people walk by and just stand and stare at me sitting here talking to myself in the Huntington lobby, but um, we got it done. So I know Mike has a, there's a survey that you guys can do in, in some closing things. So uh, we'll just open it up for questions for these last few minutes. Yeah, we'll open it up for questions. Feel free to type questions into the question box or in the chat. In the chat, everyone will be able to see only myself and Scott can see if you do the question box, but there are some coming in. Um, will you be sharing the slides? Scott, do we have permission to share the slides? Yeah, um, I have this presentation that I did that I couldn't get to work and I can share that with you. So okay. um, my, my, um, my email is um, S-C-O-T-T -T dot A-N-D-E-R-S-O-N, Scott dot Anderson, and it's at mha dot o h i o dot g o v. So it's Scott it dot Anderson. We put it into the chat so everyone has Scott's email, so, and you can email him, and he can give you this this presentation so can, or the other one that he was going to do, which is pretty similar information. Um, put on. Um, and one of my um notes is that this session was recorded. So you can find it at um, the PGNO YouTube channel, which will be on the email you get after this webinar. Um, after the webinar concludes, you'll be prompted to complete an evaluation, and that's when you'll be sent uh, a confirmation that the evaluation was completed and that you will be uh, given your CEUs once they are completed. And inside that email will be the link to uh, the Problem Gambling Network of Ohio YouTube channel where you can find this recorded webinar and many of our other recorded webinars that we've done um, in the past. Um, uh, let's see, Scott, we have another question. Um,
going back to the slide showing the odds in the house's favor of each game, could you do a sample conversation of how you would explain this to a client? Um, yeah, sure. Um, you can, if you're familiar with um, the, the British Lottery Corporation in uh, Canada came up with a, a program called GameSense. And GameSense uh, was was uh, used, it's used by the MGM properties. We just have one here in Ohio. But if you look at GameSense, if you look at the GameSense website, you can print off sheets with these odds that are on them. So you can share that that exact knowledge with someone. You know, that's why I say, what type of game do you play? Well, let's look at this. And you can actually have that sheet in front of you and say, well, this is from the game site, Game Sense website, and these are the odds of those games. So, um, and you can, you know, use that in conversation as saying, you know, over time, you know, and and uh, Steve uh, Steve Capel up at Zeph has a great question that he asks his clients. He says, I'm going to, I want you to imagine all the money that you've won in a pile right here and all the money that you've lost in a pile over here, which, which pile is bigger. And the people will almost always say the pile that I lost yet. And still you go into the casino every day thinking you're going to win, even though there's overwhelming evidence against that. So here is the evidence. These are the, this is what over time the casino is going to do every single time. So you can actually have this sheet in front of you as a handout or or give it to someone, you know, to take home or, or direct to that website. So it's called Game Sense. It's a it's a really great program. Thank you. Any other questions? I see one. Um, when um, just to repeat some of the uh, the ending material. So when we end the webinar, you will be prompted to complete uh, a webinar evaluation. And when that is submitted, um, that will prompt you receiving a confirmation email that you completed the webinar and that your CEUs will be coming. We're still waiting on those to be um, approved by some of the, the relevant boards as obviously a lot of different things are going on. And you'll also receive a link to the PGNO YouTube channel um, where you can find this recorded webinar and many of the other ones we've done. We've done uh, webinars recently on recovery advocates, and we had two recovery advocates in Ohio share their experiences and some resources. And we did one last week with two gambling clinicians in Ohio that shared case presentations. Um, so you can find that and many other others. Uh, Derek posted the link in the chat. Uh, in the chat box, so you can see it there and 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 use that. We also have uh, on June nineteenth another webinar on how to work with colleges uh, during and post COVID nineteen. As uh, you know, many of us, if if you're in the prevention, if you're on the prevention side of things, may have done work with colleges and you know even high schools or middle schools. How are we going to continue that type of programming and keep uh, students and communities engaged when we may be able to have uh, less interaction with them. So that'll be on June 19th. Uh, we also did another webinar with Stacy Fraunapel Hassan at Ohio Moss um, around data. So that was a really interesting session. So check all those out. Derek also put the link pgnohio.org slash events in the chat box where you can find many of our events and registrations for upcoming webinars and upcoming trainings and some of the other uh, programming that that we do. Um, Scott, I am not seeing, oh, getting some more, uh, getting some more questions in here. I have um, <clears throat> Karen uh, Russo from the Ohio Lottery. Um, she, she and I were the original two people that started all this way back in 2011. Uh, she just texted me to remind folks uh, on the, the lottery has a, a, a responsible gamble responsible campaign called Keep It Fun Ohio. It's keepitfunohio.com. And on that, there is an odds calculator. So you can put a game in and you can it'll it'll show you your odds. So that would be another example of how to how to talk about odds with folks. Uh, it's the keepitfunohio.com. There's a lot of other resources on that on that website as well too. So um, you can find a, a gambling an odds calculator on there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Scott, I think one last thing I could add to um, the House Edge one when talking to folks um, is also that casino game 
since you use casino games as the example, um, have rules that the the dealer or the casino uh, staff is following, whereas the the consumer or customer does not. So if you look at a game like blackjack, uh, the house is playing the best odds where the dealer hits on 16 and asks for another card or stays on 17. So if you were to play the same types of odds that the casino dealer is playing, you may win more often, whereas uh, folks in that seat at that time uh, get a little frisky, if you will, or get a little risky, and maybe they decide to hit on 17 or hit on 18 or hit on 19. You know, we, we, we start to quote unquote gamble. Um, so there's another edge that the house has where they're following statistical rules and guidelines that increase your chances of winning, where we sometimes sit down at those tables and start to take more of a chance. Uh, let's see. And I think that um, looks like the end of questions and chat. So again, um, thank you very much for being with us. Awesome job, Scott. Uh, very thorough. Glad that you could join us. Thank you for everybody that was on and uh, continue to check out um, pgnohio.org and check out keepitfunohio.com. A lot of great resources and information on both of those websites. And we look forward to having you again on a future webinar. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, everybody.